All right. Third time is hopefully the charm. Um, YouTube is kind of, I don't know what's going on with it today, but first time was uh, YouTube's fault. Second time was mine for not setting it as a public uh, AMA, well, public stream. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to do it again and start from here and we'll uh, hopefully now we, yeah we, we've got more people watching <laughs> at this time so the first time i don't know what happened to the uh, actual stream when i went in to try to use it um the uh first one you know just disappeared and so um yeah we had to give it another shot so I am posting in um, Facebook right now. I've posted on Twitter the stream thing. So now we're going to just hit LinkedIn and see if we can fix that. And then I will start taking questions and answering them. I apologize for, I, you know, I saw uh, about 10 minutes before um, people had posted questions. And those are now, of course, lost in the ether forever wherever it is that old YouTube stuff goes to. And um, yeah, all right. So let's fix this LinkedIn thing. And then, oh, I have to go in and fix the patron thing too as well. So, all right, here we go. Third time's the charm. Uh, go to Patreon. And post that one. All of this posting stuff is is so slow, you know. So many different things that have to be done. Um, it's when you kind of wish you had a virtual assistant to to handle those. Uh, all right, here's the AMA link. Um, get that shot out, and let's see what we got going on. All right, we've got some questions here uh already <clears throat> oh good and steven posted his again so i'm going to take steven's first uh which is a very intriguing question and address that um first here um i was wondering if you were ever deep into kierkegaard something you might consider a kierkegaardian phase uh which of his works do you find the most important and why so uh, let me actually start with the second part of the question first. I'm a big fan of philosophical fragments, which I think you can probably tell by the fact that I devoted seven you know, hour-long videos to discussing it. And that wasn't originally planned. I was only actually planning to do two of them. Um, but you know, it, it kept expanding and expanding because I was like, well, I got to talk about this and talk about this and talk about this. And I think that, you know, when it comes to some of the things that I'm really interested in, like the, how it is that, that Christianity contributes something to philosophy, not just to think about, but, you know, in, in, in sort of like, you might say penetrating it, I think philosophical fragments is probably the best work for that. Um, you know, you notice I've, I've taught Fear and Trembling another, a number of times. That's a work that I like quite a bit. Um, Sickness unto Death is, is really quite cool. Um, what else? You know, the, the Two Ages, uh, I like those reflections in there. Um, Either Or is a very long work, but well worth reading. And, you know, there's, the, and there's others as well. I like, I like some of Kierkegaard's sermons. And I never went through a Kierkegaardian phase. I, I did read quite a bit of Kierkegaard, but I think part of what you know kept me from having a phase like that was the fact that um, you know when I was an undergraduate and I went through my Nietzsche phase, which extended into grad school, I had um, you know I, I I wasn't considering religion in any serious way. Um, I was much more interested in, in philosophy of language and um, questions of ethics and things like that. And I, I kind of saw Kierkegaard as, as very interesting with his emphasis on individuality, but not to be taken seriously because he was a, you know, religiously based thinker, um, albeit one who also thought that most other religious people were not really religious. Um, and then by the time that I was, you know, reading him carefully, I'd gotten into other people as well. So, 
you know, um, I was I was reading Kierkegaard quite a bit in graduate school, and then after that, and I, I won't really say that I, I had any phases after graduate school. Um, it was more like adding adding people to the repertoire, adding people to the conversation. And so Kierkegaard has been somebody who I I enjoy, but I never really went through a, a phase. All right, um, Lauren Crawford, just thinking about your advice or stoic advice for this virus and change in daily life. Maybe are you talking about the radio show that we did last night, Dan Hayes and I? Um, which, by the way, it, it, I don't know if you know this. There was an email that was sent out that we didn't get to all the show producers saying, stay away. We're shutting down indefinitely. River West Radio is not going to do any more live shows. And then me and Dan show up and they're like, well, I'll, I guess since you're here, we'll, we'll, we'll let you do it. And we had already like um, decided to, to pivot the episode that we were going to talk about, which was going to be about, you know, figuring out what's good and what's what's not good and thinking about the Stoics and Buddhists and Epicureans and Aristotelians and things like that. And we said, well, let's talk about fear and the coronavirus. And so that's what we, we oriented the show on. Um, so if that was helpful for you, that that's great. Um, Italian Review uses polyrhythmic polysyllables. If you could choose one text for speculative fiction series, what would it be? It wouldn't because we don't take things that are usually just one text. The point of the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series is to talk about authors who have more than one text and um, where there's a narrative universe <clears throat> straddling those different texts. So we don't really do one-offs like that where, where there's just one particular text. Now, if we change the question a little bit, to something along the lines of if there was one thinker or one series that you would do for the world's, I'm going to move this light a little bit, fix the lighting a little bit better. If there was one that you would do for worlds of speculative fiction, what would it be? I mean, anytime that I want to do one, I put it into the next year's thing. So I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Um, are you saying if there was only one that I could do, then it wouldn't be a series? So I, I'm not actually, I, I have to kind of punt on this one. Um, Saad, concerning Aristotle, how, is, how important is physics to understanding metaphysics? Also, which books or ideas are important to that work? So you're, are you asking about how important is his physics to understanding his metaphysics? It's important, but it's not absolutely important. You can read the one independent of the other. If you're asking about the discipline of current physics, um, there's really not, nothing to, to say about that in Aristotelian metaphysics, I think, because, you know, current physics is an entirely different paradigm than, than Aristotelian physics and metaphysics. Uh, Hamed, what do I think about the coronavirus? Well, I think that, um, you know, we're in a time of crisis now, and we're presented with some interesting opportunities, um, at least some of us, and, and many people are really, really screwed. And they're screwed um, sometimes as a result of, you know, local decisions, but oftentimes because of national decisions, bad decisions that have been made now for uh, several presidential administrations, and particularly this one. Um, a lot of states and cities are doing a terrible job, and there's a lot of people who are going to be out of work and um, figuring out what to do with social distancing and self-quarantining and having a very rough time of it. And I think my students are probably kind of anxious as well because they don't know what's going on. Um, and they've never had it, most of them, particularly good. But we, we do have the opportunity to actually practice what we preach when it comes to ethics now. This is where we'll see, you know, uh, the people who are, you know, speculating in toilet paper. They're showing you what kind of people they are. Um, all right, let's see. Dale, do I find that grappling with deep questions can cause existential anxiety? Any advice for this? Yeah, of course, because um, when you're actually sort of peeling back all the comfortable uh, tissues of half-truths, half-lies that, that you know keep society propped up and keep people happy with themselves, um, yeah, it can provoke anxiety. It can provoke all sorts of other emotions as well. Sadness, rage, disgust. Um, it can also provoke joy. Um, it can provoke hope. It can provoke positive emotions. 
but it probably you know ought to do something when you're when you're looking reality more squarely in the face i'm not saying you're looking reality you know in the face perfectly but definitely um seeing things you know more for what they are which often brings up new questions and new challenges um and you see that things are not as fixed as they were claimed to be right you lose that that feeling of certainty or the ground being beneath your feet um and so you know that's uh that's a normal thing any advice for it uh don't you know just uh don't get lost in it but don't try to pretend it doesn't exist um that's that's what i would say and then you know figure out what you're anxious about and remind yourself that you don't have to actually understand the totality of existence in order to have a good existence and to do some good in existence. All right. Uh, Andre, uh, I was wondering if I've read anything by Simone Weil. I did way back in graduate school. I never really enjoyed her all that much. Um, and I don't really, you know, I, she's not somebody who's like a reference point for me. Um, but she's, you know, she's, she's, you know, an interesting philosopher, right? There's quite a few people who are into her that I know. Uh, Piero Bazzion, have I ever read Paley's Natural Theology? If so, what did I think of it? I made a stab at it. Um, Paley's very boring to read. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's example after example after example after example. As a matter of fact, kind of give Bentham a run for his money for being boring. Um so that, that's why I don't think too many people read him these days. That and you know, people don't don't take natural theology that seriously in many quarters as well. Um, but his his book of natural theology is is essentially like one big design argument all lumped in together with all sorts of examples. And you know, it's it's is it worth reading it as a whole? Probably not for most people. Um, it's worth reading, you know, his discuss his his analogy of the watch, which is anthologized in a lot of um, philosophy of religion textbooks and and collections. I don't know that it's worth reading too much more be besides that. All right, um, headphone jack. Which work of Dostoevsky do you think has been the most influential? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, you know, Brothers Karamazov is often brought up, but it's usually only brought up in terms of the Grand Inquisitor passage, or chapter, rather, and not in terms of itself as a totality, uh, even though there's a lot of other great stuff in there. Like just the chapter before it has this, this you know, I don't say wonderful in a, like a you know, aesthetic sense, um, but really well worked out argument from evil being brought about by Ivan in discussing it with Alyosha as well. That worth, I think, putting into philosophy of religion classes. Um, you know, my favorite work by, by Dostoevsky is um, the, uh, the possessed slash the demons, depending on how you translate it. <clears throat> Cause I actually think that is best and it's got the sort of, you know, broadest, set of characters engaging with each other doing philosophy and not doing philosophy back and out philosophy but like cashing things out and trying to live out philosophy and clashing with each other um but i don't think too many people read that really um crime and punishment you know that's been pretty influential but again i think just for certain passages so really you know maybe it's notes from the underground has been the most influential um but that's that would be a great question for like a Dostoevsky scholar. They would have more insight into that than I would. Um, Volkolak, when Camus criticizes leaps of faith made by the existentialists, is his idea we must imagine Sisyphus happy, not just another leap? No, I don't think so because there's a whole argument there, and he's um, he's explored you know how it is that you would live in the um absence of of hope um and part of that has to do with you know revolt 
and Sisyphus is indeed revolting, and it's possible to be happy in revolt. So I don't I don't see that as a leap of faith. Um, so you probably want to go back and and like read, you know, like from the second half on all the way to the end when he's got that whole chapter on Sisyphus. Um, that would probably be helpful. Uh, hmm, what is your point of view on Stoicism? Is it the most practical school of thought in Western philosophy? No, um, there's plenty of practical schools of thought in Western philosophy, many of which we associate with being theoretical, like, you know, Platonism or Aristotelianism. But I mean, if you want to see Platonism being practical, well, you don't just read Plato, you read Plutarch, right? Or the uh, later Neoplatonists, um, or some of the, you know, Renaissance and, 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 and you know, the Cambridge Platonists, right? Um, with Aristotle, Aristotle's philosophy is eminently practical as well. Um, the Stoics are very practical. The Stoics are also very theoretical if you, if you read their works. Um, Seneca will give you a run for your money. And, um, you know, even Descartes' philosophy is practical. A lot of people don't see it that way, but that's only because they read the discourses and the meditations, and they only read it for like the arguments or the ideas, and they don't think about how Descartes thought this would lead to a transformation of society, and and in part it it, it has. You know, Descartes is one of the fathers of modernity. Um, he thought that our world would be transformed by getting the metaphysics right, and then the other three M's: medicine, which would cover everything of the body, and also you know of of the psychology, uh, morals. And uh, mechanics. And mechanics is what we call technology. So, you know, Stoicism is not the most practical. Um, I think Stoicism is a, a great philosophical school. It has a lot to contribute. Um, I'm not a orthodox Stoic in the sense that I think Stoicism is the only, the best, or anything like that. I do draw heavily on Stoicism in my coaching work and consulting and, you know, I teach Stoic philosophy. I edit Stoicism today. So obviously you can tell that I think that it's, it's quite important. Um, all right. Uh, Hangover Hayes has a really challenging question here are the following. Who do you think does the best job of interpreting Hegel? Robert Brandom, Robert Pippin, Slavo Zizek, Terry Pinkard, Jean Hippolyte, or Alexander Kozhev. So we can drop Kozhev out right off the bat, and we can drop Zizek out right off the bat because both of them are doing their own thing, right? And Hegel is is sort of, you know, um, part of what, what they're doing. But when you read Kozhev, you're reading more Kozhev than Hegel. Um, and I don't really know uh, Pippin's work very well. Um, Pinkard, I, I really have, you know, I, I really just look at his uh, translation, which is quite good. Um, but then again, Hippolyte's translation is quite good, right? The French translation with all those wonderful footnotes so much that it has to be split into two volumes. Um, so I don't know. I can say that that Brandom is very insightful. Um, Hippolyte stays very close to the text, which I like as well. Um, and, you know, I, I, I add some other people in there as well. I mean, why not talk about... Um, some, you know, other contemporary uh, phenomenologists, some of whom are, are still alive, uh, who interpreted Hegel, um, like uh, Pepperzak or you know, people like that. I don't think we need to, to, to decide, like, who, who's the, doing the best job in interpreting Hegel, though. Um, because, you know, one thing to keep in mind is Hegel isn't right about a lot of stuff, you know, and the big Hegelian project really depends. He, for, for some reason, Hegel thinks that unless he's got it fundamentally right, you know, the whole thing falls apart. And that's kind of a dangerous thing to do in your philosophy. But, you know, obviously he got the end of history wrong and, and he, um, you know, the, the dialectics that he, he sets out are, are, you, he says that they're all totally necessary, but it doesn't always quite seem that way, you know, when you think about it. All right, here's here's a thing from Ale, from Andrew Wu. Thank you very much for all the videos you made. Those self-directed study guides are very helpful for beginners. Love from China. Well, I'm glad you like them, and I do intend to do more. I've been 
<clears throat> a little bit tied up lately, so I haven't I haven't done as many as I would have liked. But later, I mean, now with the coronavirus and and the self isolating thing that we're doing and like not going places, um, I'll definitely get the Augustine one <laughs> done for this month, and then I can get cracking on the Boethius one. And then I, I need to do one on Thomas Aquinas. And then I think that'll be enough for medieval stuff for a little while. And I can jump into modern things. Obviously, Descartes is a big one we need to do. Hobbes, um, probably Spinoza, Leibniz, um, Locke, uh, Pascal, Barclay. Um, who else? Of Hume, of course, you know. Um, that's all early modern philosophy. Maybe, you know, it'd be good to, it, probably we should do one on Vico as well, right? Um, get a little bit off the beaten path. And, uh, but now we're projecting out like quite a, quite a ways in advance. So I'm glad that they're very helpful for you. And that's, that's, that's great. All right. Um, Abdul, are your university courses going to be moved online because of the pandemic? They already have officially but they haven't been completely built out online. So here's where it gets really interesting, right? Um, let's start by talking about the, the general thing, and then I'll tell you what I'm doing with my classes. So this semester, I'm teaching at three places. Um, one of them, I'm already only teaching online, and that's Milwaukee Area Technical College. So those classes just proceed as normal. Um, one of them is a prison class for inmates in Wisconsin prisons called the Second Chance Pell Program, and the other is just a regular intro to philosophy class that, that's 12 weeks long. So those, you know, those online classes stay online. Milwaukee Area, or Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, they made their decision last week that all, all classes are going to have like a week extra break because they were on spring break. Uh, literally going up till till uh, Monday would be spring break. So they're extending it an extra week. And then all the classes are going online for the rest of the semester, which to me seems the most prudent thing to do. Carthage, uh, which is down in Kenosha, Carthage College, they are doing something similar. They're extending spring break a week, and then their classes are going online, but they're not staying online for good they're, they want the students to come back and have face-to-face -face classes in mid-April. And that, to me, seems like... I understand why they're doing it, but I th it doesn't seem like a very well-thought-out idea because what if the coronavirus turns out to be worse than we thought? Then now they have to re... Uh, you know, uh, they have to change their direction yet again it would have been better just to go straight online. But a lot of the local uh, state colleges here in Wisconsin are doing a similar thing. Uh, have a week of break, everybody goes online, come back sometime in April. And so I'm not teaching at those places, but I know about them. And I haven't actually checked. I think Marquette might be doing um, everyone goes online, stays online. But I, I'm not quite sure. So how do you go online? And this is where things get really interesting. So class sessions can be done remotely using video conferencing technology, right? So Zoom is an example of that. You see that a lot in the news right now. Um, we use freeconferencecall.com. And by we, I mean my, my wife and I with our businesses, right? So um, when I'm doing my half-hour Hegel, half -hour Hegel uh, Q&A sessions, freeconferencecall.com. been using it for six, seven years now. Um, Google Hangouts are another option, right? Um, and if your school actually does have a Google suite, you have Google Hangouts and you have the Google Hangouts that lets you have more than 10 people in at a time. So you can hold classes online, right? And you can do things like have a PowerPoint and have you narrating through it or stuff like that. So that's all possible to do. And, you know, you every class that's being taught right now has a course management system. It's either Blackboard or Desire to Learn or Moodle or Canvas or uh, Schoology or, you know, there's a whole bunch of other ones out there, right? But those are, those are the real big ones. And I, I've used them all um, at this point. And 
if you're a good face-to-face -face teacher, you've already built a lot of online content for your class. If you're a lazy, doesn't keep up with the technology, face-to-face -face teacher, well, now you're kind of screwed, right? So, but, you know, for me, so I have two face-to-face -face classes this semester, right? One is at Carthage College. It's a business ethics class. The other one is at Milwaukee area, uh, <laughs> Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, and it's an intro to humanities class. So I've already made the um, Carthage business ethics class online. I've got, a, you know, over 100 videos that I shot for that business ethics class that are in a different channel, um, not my main channel. I use them for when I teach business ethics. I'm going to shoot some more as well, like this this coming week uh, to supplement those. But they've got lots of material, right? And so if you're doing face-to-face -face in a good way, uh, you can go online pretty quickly. And that's that's what I'm doing. Um, so, you know, not that not that big of an issue for me, but it is for a lot of my peers. And it's, you know, um, it's interesting too. So here's another bit of a, uh, you can call it a rant if you want. For roughly like 15, 20 years, we've had educational experts telling us all sorts of garbage about like the generations. <clears throat> and interestingly, it's been mostly boomers telling us Gen Xers about the millennials, right? And the idea was that, you know, boomers, they grew up without, you know, mobile or internet or any of that sort of stuff. They basically had TV and radio and mimeographed things. Um, and so, you know, adapting to technology was a whole new world to them. They were not natives to it, right? By contrast, the millennials grew up with technology. <clears throat> they were digital natives. And so they had a more intuitive grasp of it and they knew how to use it. We better use it to like relate to them. And, you know, then us Gen Xers were in the middle and they'd be lecturing us about how we need to get with the times and like, you know, be doing things on our phone and talking to our students on Twitter and stuff like that. And, you know, we, we, we Gen Xers who are the people who were like in the trenches at the time, you know, the young professors teaching students, we were like, what the hell are you talking about? These kids don't actually know how to use technology. They know how to push buttons. They know how to do a few things, but they don't fully understand the, the scope of the, the platforms that they're using or the apps or things like that. As a matter of fact, we understand it better generally because we were the ones who had to grow into it and adapt to it. And so now, you know, the millennials are out of college. They've been out of college. You know, and now it's Generation Z. And we're seeing the same thing with, you know, oh, well, you know, the, it's going to be an easy transition for them because they all know how to use technology. But no, they don't. When it comes to course management systems, like, again, Blackboard or Moodle or stuff like that, or even how to use email effectively. Um, or get onto an online video conferencing platform, a lot of these, these kids don't know how to do it. And so we have to, you know, provide tutorials and hold their hand a bit and help them deal with their anxieties about it. <clears throat> and um, it's going to be a challenge, you know, but we'll, we'll get through it, I think. All right. Uh, Andre, uh, what are the branches of philosophy that interest me the most? Well, I think you can tell by looking at the videos that I've created that ethics is really important for me. Um, and, you know, closely allied with ethics, uh, social and political philosophy, very interested in that. I also am still interested in philosophy of language, uh, not as like obsessed with it as I used to be when I was uh, an undergraduate and, and graduate student, but I think it's important. And we could expand it further and talk about, you know, semiotics, philosophy of communication. Um, I've always been interested in philosophy of religion. Um, that That's an area. Um, and I suppose you could say I am interested in sort of philosophy of history in the sense that I, I do want to like, be able to uh, say what what you know what's going on and what how we can think about historical developments in a more philosophical way without necessarily doing like the universal history kind of stuff uh, where there's like one single narrative that dominates everything um, that's usually bad history um, I mean I'm interested in metaphysics 
I'm more interested in the metaphysics of the person than I am in like, you know, what is, what is this world out here? Is it atoms or is it something else? I'm, I'm, you know, more interested in that. And you can say a similar thing with epistemology. I'm not interested in epistemology for its own sake, but more for thinking about like, you know, how do we get deceived and undeceived and things like that. So that's probably a good, good way to talk about it. Um, let's see. Ixo, what would Nietzsche say about COVID-19? Um, I think he would just see it as an, yet another plague, you know, uh, pandemic. It's not like history hasn't been filled with these. Um, you know, we, we, we've been fairly lucky here in the first world for quite a while, but, you know, we're bound to get some pretty serious illnesses coming up from time to time, particularly so long as our healthcare system remains the hot mess that it is, you know, um, and we don't have anything like universal healthcare. Um, you know, we, we, we do need to start thinking about these, these things in a bigger picture way. Um, let's see here. John or Johan, <clears throat> have I ever struggled with nihilism? If we understand nihilism, because it's it's meant a couple different things to different people, we can understand nihilism sort of in the, let's call it the passive sense versus the active sense where somebody is embracing nihilism. So the passive sense would be this, um, you know, viewpoint that says there really is no meaning undergirding everything. Um, and usually it's, it's also sort of counterpoised to, and we thought that there was meaning, so this sucks, right? Yeah, I've struggled with that. Um, and, you know, Nietzsche thought that nihilism was going to be the central problem of the 20th century that he didn't live to see, unfortunately. Um, and I think he was right. It is one of the central problems, and it remains a central problem today. And, you know, nihilism can only be a problem when the great ideologies that promise to, like, give us answers to everything and give us a home where we could live and develop turned out to be half bullshit and, um, you know, inconsistent and not living up to their own ideals. And and that is the case in, in many cases. So, so it is something that we have to face up to. But that doesn't mean that we have to become nihilists in an active sense. All right. Um, <clears throat> headphone Jack, uh, which philosophers have influenced me the most? I mean, it, it's hard to say. There's there's so many uh, at this point in time. Um, I'm, you know, my head is sort of a stew of a whole bunch of different <laughs> ingredients. I mean, Aristotle is a big one. Uh, Epictetus, Plato, Plutarch, Cicero. And there we're just still in the ancient period. Um, obviously Anselm, somebody I've writ written on a lot, um, Hobbes to some degree, you know, more like, well, we don't want things to go the Hobbesian way. Um, Nietzsche has been quite influential on me. Uh, Maurice Blondel, Hegel, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, I mean, we could go on and on and on. It, it, uh, and it, it, which, which has influenced me more than the others depends on when you ask me, I think, you know, LP, in times like this, with how people are acting in this panic, do you feel the Grand Inquisitor was right and burdening us with freedom was unfair? Well, so let's, <clears throat> for those who aren't, you know, completely familiar with the Grand Inquisitor chapter in Dostoevsky's uh, Brothers Karamazov, let's let's discuss a little bit what the Grand Inquisitor was, was saying. Christ shows up <clears throat> during the... Um, the Inquisition, right? And now Christ showing up is is in some respect a bad thing for the Grand Inquisitor because he's doing things that are very unchristian in the in the name of Christianity, and he goes into this lengthy harangue against Christ, who doesn't say anything the entire time about how you know you brought people freedom and you let them choose for themselves and this is a bad thing we provide bread we provide certainty we provide all these things that human beings really do crave and dostoevsky does believe that those are central human desires um now why why is it a bad thing to have the sort of freedom 
uh, that's open-ended and allows us the possibility to be real, you know, real jerks to each other. Um, well, because, you know, I mean, you could go back to Augustine. It, if you provided human beings with wills and they weren't free wills, they really wouldn't be wills and they wouldn't be good as wills, even though they can do bad things with it. <clears throat> so, um, now, that's that's the Dostoevsky thing, and the Grand Inquisitor is putting forth this kind of you know social social engineering perspective that says that we should you know have um, we should minimize freedom so that um, we can maximize something else instead like security or um, human happiness. And you could say, well, it's a kind of truncated human happiness because when people can't actually choose things, they're not really that happy, are they? And sometimes people actually want to be able to choose the wrong thing. Uh, you know, the underground man makes this point, right? Um, now, does the current virus outbreak and what's going on, you know, does that illustrate things being so bad that we we really ought to, like, take on something like the Grand Inquisitor? I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. I think we would have to, things would have to get much, 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 much worse in order for that to be the case. Um, I mean, we have people doing stupid things like there's runs on toilet paper. I, you know, I've never seen a case where people are so obsessed with their their butts. Uh, you know, I was talking with my my aunt, who's a nurse, <clears throat> about this because they're you know she's down in Indiana and they're having runs on toilet paper there. And she was like, I mean, if worse came to worse, you can just you know wipe your butt with a soapy rag and you'll you'll be okay. You know, I mean, but there's there's a lot of like fear-driven stuff and toilet paper has suddenly become the currency of the land, right? And it's almost farcical rather than, than tragic at this point. Um, you know, there are people hoarding it. There's people panic buying it. There's people who are speculating in it. That's not that bad. I mean, what's bad are things instead like people who know that they're sick who don't, you know, like need to go work, but but are going out to the stores to buy up all, all the stuff. Um, and then there's a lot of other jerkish behavior as well, but it, a lot of it has to do with control. Bosses who are saying, uh, you can't take a sick day or I'll fire you. Um, they're behaving more like the Grand Inquisitor than like anything else. So I don't know that we want that. And, you know... Um, we probably do need to have a much more coordinated national response to this sort of stuff. You know, whoever, whoever winds up becoming uh, president and whatever the composition of the Senate and uh, uh, you know, um, house of representatives is, they really do need to get their shit together next time around, because this won't be the only time that we have a pandemic. Right. And maybe next time we need to not pretend that it's, it's not an issue and make tests available and not cut funds for the, you know, uh, important medical things and not, you know, focus more on wall street and the insurance companies, you know, uh, do you have to be a grand inquisitor to, to rein that sort of nonsense in? I don't think so. You know? So yeah. All right. Uh, auntie Gaia, are you a fan of any of the Alan Moore graphic novels? Never looked at any of them. So not really. Uh, Hamed, are you familiar with the Persian poet Rumi and if there are, there are relations between him and Rilke? I'm familiar with them. Haven't read them, you know, again, since graduate school, because there were people who were into him then. Um, I don't know of any connections to Rilke, but you know, I'm not a, I'm not a Rumi scholar, so I wouldn't know. Um, made of clay. What did Kierkegaard mean when he said that when a danger is so great, great one, when a danger is so great, One's hope becomes death, but the even greater danger would be when one loses the hope to die. How does that connect to people? Um, I don't really have much offhand to say about that. I don't know. I'd have to look at the passage. Um, uh, when a danger is so great, one's hope becomes death, but the even greater danger would be when lo one loses the hope to die. I mean, it sounds like typical Kierkegaard hyperbole at one point. Celicious, if the U.S. were in the shoes of China, do you think the corona outbreak would have been much worse? Do authoritarian governments have more utility to tackle such problems at the cost of human rights? Well, that's an interesting one. I was talking about this with a friend of mine the other day who's Australian, right? 
and he's he's uh you know very interested in what's happening in hong kong so he's he pays very close attention to what's going on in the mainland china and we're talking about how how bad the u.s response was um which probably would be a better response i mean i'm not a fan of of uh hillary clinton but if she had been elected we probably would have had a much better coronavirus response because we wouldn't have cut um, funding to the important agencies and it, the agencies wouldn't be staffed with people who are afraid to contradict the, the, you know, president. And, and I almost call them something different. Um, so, you know, we, we could have actually had a better response. Um, but we have a particularly bad and corrupt administration, which sort of concentrates, um, quite a few of the, um, negative tendencies of, of our system. China is also a corrupt uh, uh, bureaucracy as well. Um, their, their response was more effective in some respects, but they also screwed up in other ways too. And so, you know, I don't think it's a question of authoritarian versus liberal democracy or something like that. I think it, you know, we, we have to actually like look at the regimes as they are. Um, I mean, South Korea managed to contain things. Taiwan managed to contain things pretty well, and neither of them are particularly authoritarian, are they? They're they're actually liberal democracies uh, as well, um, but they have a different prioritization of public health. Um, I mean, here's something that I hope this leads to. Here in the United States, for far too long. We have allowed the political discourse about healthcare to be dominated by, you know, the insurance companies and um, by all sorts of, you know, crazy ideas coming to us, largely from the right, but sometimes also from the center left. And um, we've looked at healthcare as something that isn't a isn't a human right, and that's not the way it used to be in the past. I mean, read uh, Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, you know. Uh, speech. Uh, look at how things like this were, were treated in the past. Healthcare, um, decent healthcare, not like top of the line healthcare, but we don't need top of the line healthcare to, to, to be safe and, and to be healthy. Um, it really ought to be something that we're investing in, you know? It, it, and when somebody says, oh, there's no money for it, we pissed away trillions on our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq with very little to show for it we could actually afford it if we wanted to. There just isn't the political will because there's a lot of people who have nutty ideas and keep putting those nutty ideas out there and amplifying them about how, oh, you know, we're going to lose our, our, our wonderful healthcare system. It's not wonderful for most people. Man, if you lose your employer-provided healthcare, you're screwed. Nobody can afford COBRA, right? Um, and if you're on the ACA marketplaces like myself and my wife are, Every year it goes up. There's high copays. There's high deductibles. It costs you a good bit of money. It's not like a, a handout or something like that. But you know, we've we've had this this fundamentally stupid way of talking about it for so long. Maybe now it's time to shift. Maybe now it's time to look at what has been done in other places and say, "Wow, we ought to we ought to just like get with the times instead of you know pretending that we're." exceptional. We are being exceptional. We're being exceptional in the sense of having a crappy, not even system, just a patchwork of systems in, in play. So yeah, that's, that's, and again, it doesn't have to be done in an authoritarian way. Um, but it, it will have to be done in a way that, that is much less focused on individual liberty for the sake of its own, you know, uh, uh, value or stuff like that. I mean, individual liberty doesn't do anybody any good if they if they die because they can't afford insulin. Um, all right, so let, let's go on. Uh, Andre, any thoughts on Nick Bostrom? No thoughts at all. Um, Jake Susi, I remember you talking about being in the Army. My question is, what was your MOS and experience in the Army? Do you have any advice for people who are enlisting? I do have a little bit of advice because not much of what I have to say, I was in the army 30 years ago, right? So not much of what I have to say is even applicable in the present. I will say this, when your recruiter tells you that, you know, whatever it is that you want to have in, in your enlistment stuff, that uh, doesn't need to be in the paperwork. They can take care of that in your regular duty station. They are lying to you. 
that will not happen. I, I wanted to go, you know, Rangers, right? And I, you know, the recruiter promised me that I wanted to, you know, go down to Fort Bragg and do all the training. And then when I got to my regular duty station in uh, Germany, and I was like, so uh, when when do I go for, you know, I want to apply for Ranger training. They said we could do this. They're like, oh, so you believe them, huh? Uh, too bad for you. You're staying here. <laughs> Uh, and then, so it never happened. Um, so that's one thing. I don't really know enough about, you know, what, what's, what's going on for enlistment at, at present. I, well, I could say this, if you get a bonus, don't blow your bonus on crazy stuff, put it in the bank because you're going to need it sooner or later. Um, and you know, when you're getting out, go to a good VA because uh, veterans care differs considerably. The VA here in Milwaukee is quite good. Go down to Chicago, they don't get the same quality of care. Go up to the Fox Cities, they don't get the same quality of care as they do here in Milwaukee. Um, so that's, you know, that's that. Now, what was my MOS? I was a 12 Bravo, a combat engineer. And what that means is that I, I you know, learned... We did, we did the same, you know, basic training as everybody else, but it was combined with AIT. So it was a 13 week course instead of the eight week and then go off to AIT. And, um, basic training at that time consisted in, you know, weapons training, uh, mostly centered out around your, your, you know, M16, you know, taking it apart all the time and stuff like that. But we did learn how to do, you know, the M60 machine gun and M203 grenade launcher. And we had a grenade course and stuff like that. A lot of nuclear biological chemical training, uh, because at that time we thought we were going to be fighting Warsaw Pact and that, you know, we'd probably have to worry about nerve gas or biological agents. Um, a lot of medical training um, because you have to, you know, take care of yourself and your fellow soldiers. And then the engineer stuff was like built bridge building obstacles, you know, um, minefield stuff, demolition, all sorts of cool things like that. And um, then when we got to our regular duty station, you know, you, your training would continue with some of that. But fortunately in Germany, they didn't like us building bridges. So we didn't have to screw around with all that, that garbage. That's a pain in the rear, you know. Um, and we got to, you know, go out to the range and blow stuff up and put up concertina wire fences and do a lot of infantry stuff because engineers are expected to act like infantry uh, a good bit of the time as well. So that's, that's what it was like. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. I have flat sheet. Have you seen Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times? I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I saw it back when I took a film class, and I was like, okay, yep, critique of capitalism. You know, I mean, it's pretty straightforward what's going on there. Uh, if, if it's the one that I'm remembering, right, the one where he's in the factory, it gets sucked into the gears and all that. So, all right, Ignacio, I'm taking my first philosophy course at the uni. Any advice when going to see Plato to Butler? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, so advice about taking your first philosophy class. Um, expect to read and reread primary text multiple times. If you have a textbook, that may be easier to breeze through. But, you know, real philosophy is something that, you know, you're not going to first time around. And you even find yourself, you know, discerning new things 20 years afterwards. So there, there's a lot to it. And, you know, don't don't like... Don't get too upset with yourself if you're not grasping everything right away. A lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves when they're reading philosophy. There isn't any right order to read philosophical texts since read Aristotle before Plato. It's not going to irrevocably damage your brain so you can't ever understand it correctly, you know. All right, uh, Bozo, is it just me or the, or the contemporary atheists, uh, new atheists mostly? have very poor understanding of theology and religion in general are not willing to put their atheism under me. Um, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't say quite so hyperbolically as that, but I would say, yeah, they, they often don't have a very good understanding of what they claim to be criticizing. Um, and a lot of times what's going on with the new atheism is not new. You can find the same stuff in 19th century atheism, you know, like reading Renan or, you know, um, 
reading Compt or people like that. It's not it's not valuable because it's not providing anything fundamentally uh, new. And a lot of it is quite tendentious. Um, that said, it's not all terrible, right? Um, it, it could be worth reading some of it. So, um, you know, are they willing to put their own atheism under scrutiny? Yes, but very often in kind of a superficial way. I mean, I don't think any of them really take Nietzsche's criticism of the free-spirited atheism of his time seriously, because if they did, they would be kind of worried. And, and a lot of them fit into what, you know, in, in Sartre's um, existentialism as a humanism lecture, he talks about that 18th and 19th century atheism as essentially substituting nature for God or science for God or whatever it is that you like. So, you know, yeah. Um, something you said, what are any thoughts you've had about antinatalism? I've never actually taken it seriously enough to read the contemporary literature on it. Um, seems kind of a non-starter to me, but I don't know, maybe, maybe some, someday I'll, I'll get around to, to reading that stuff. Uh, Anus Man 69, House of the Dead was good. He's talking about Dostoevsky. Definitely when it got to the point where prisoners were celebrating Christmas. Well, there you go. Um, I mean, we, we can if we want to talk about things being good, The Idiot is good too, but I don't know it's that influential of a Dostoevsky work. Um, Bruno asks, had any issues in relationships stemming from having a lot more knowledge than the other person? As a matter of fact, yes. Uh, that has sometimes been a problem in the past, although it wasn't like the central problem in those relationships, which are no longer uh, existing. I'll just say this. Um, I had several girlfriends in college um, and one in graduate school for whom I had to ghostwrite papers because they weren't, um, they weren't very smart and they didn't know that much about the topics that they were researching. And I would help them out. It, basically, it would, it would, it would work, like, work like this. They'd be like, oh, we can't do anything this weekend. I got to write this paper. You know, uh, I'm so stressed out about it. And I'd be like, give me the friggin' thing. Let me knock this out in a few hours. Fine. Now we can go out and do what we're going to do. You know, it would be to get stuff off the docket, so to speak. That did not go over well. Um, it led to resentments on both sides, and um, but there were always other problems as well, you know. Um, Ken Blackwell just wanted to say I'm really enjoying the series on John Rawls' theory of justice. Are you planning to cover his other works? Maybe down the line. I mean, first I would actually, you know, theory of justice is this thick. I touched on just the very introduction to it it would probably be good for me to do other core concept videos on that. But I only did the ones that I needed for the ethics class that I'm teaching this semester. So I won't be going back to Rawls until, until the semester's over at least. And I, I get, get on with all my other stuff, but yeah, it would be good to do more Rawls. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Rawls, but I don't hate him. So um, yeah. Barnabas Wizard Spook, quite a name there. I know you have an interest in Hegel's philosophy. Have you ever read Fichte or other German idealists? Yeah, of course. Back in grad school, we had to read all of them, you know, um, because that was just part of the, the sort of expectation for the preliminary things. And I did my my um, uh, prelim on my main thinker on Hegel. So I had to read all the backstory stuff. Never found Fichte all that interesting. I, I do like Kant, you know, quite a bit, but I'm less interested in Kant's epistemology and much more interested in the um, moral philosophy and the stuff, you know, that comes out of the critique of judgment. Um, so, yeah. All right, Jack, uh, I've started reading pre-modern philosophy, but I want to study modern philosophy at the same time because that's more interesting. Is it necessary to read philosophy in a linear way? Not at all. I mean, you could do it that way, but you could also not do it that way. And I mean, I didn't read things sequentially most of the time, and uh, I turned out okay. I think most of my colleagues, that's the same case. I, I don't know too many people who like said, okay, must begin with the pre-Socratics, now Plato, now Aristotle, 
you know, um, now the minor Socratic schools, now Epicureanism, because Epicureanism comes before Stoicism, right? Now the Stoics, I, you don't, you don't have to do it that way. Um, it, you can, you can do it however you like to. All right, Nicholas, my dissertation question is whether the monetization or commodification of big data is ethical. Interesting idea. Um, I think that, so, so you want to hear other people's initial thoughts. My initial thought is that it's not a question of whether it is per se ethical or unethical, although you could, you could have some extreme positions where they're like, any commodification is automatically unethical. I would rather say what's important is to determine what are the conditions under which it could be ethical and then what are the conditions that are clearly unethical what you know and so you'd probably want to begin in part by looking at cases and um, saying well this this over here is definitely unethical and here's why and then sort of piece together almost like a, a constellation of those but they can also, you could also ask, well, what would make this ethical? And in some cases, the answer might be nothing, man. This is, this is evil and you can't do anything with it. But in some cases, it could be that, well, if we change this to this, change this to this, and those will reveal to you what, um, you know, what the conditions could be for it being ethical. So that's actually a project I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing, um, you know, Maybe when you've got like a prospectus worked up, you should uh, shoot it over to me that I would be interested in seeing that. All right, uh, Dov Flat, Flat Sleet. I read the Metamorphosis yesterday and watched your videos on it. I'd like to know your thoughts on how it applies to our society, if at all. Well, you know, we might always turn into a giant vermin. You never, you never know what's going to happen, right? It's a world of contingency. Now, it's more about like, well, what if, what if we were suddenly somebody who's excluded? So it could be about disability. It could be about illness. It could be about all sorts of things and the alienation that's involved. I think, you know, Kafka is, is uh, not just the metamorphosis, but a lot of his other short stories and um, his novels, the trial and, and the castle. Um, they, they lay out both images and, sort of processes that we can see at work in our own world, you know, sometimes even more so than in his day. So like, think about the trial and his, his character, um, Joseph K's realization that the law courts exist everywhere in the attics of society. And then think about our own surveillance society, right? Um, maybe Kafka in some respects is even more applicable today but we have to do a bit of stretching. We have to do, how does it apply in this way, this way, this way? We have to do a bit of that nowadays. Mark uh, Desais, um, have you read the Exhalation Sci-Fi Short Story Collection by Chiang? Uh, I have not. Um, that sounds quite interesting. So philosophical themes like whether AI bots and robots can become sentient beings. Um, no, I, 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 that's not even on my radar. Um, you should shoot me an email about that. I would be interested to, to find out about that. Um, I mean, we've dealt with some themes like that in the worlds of speculative fiction, but it, it'd always be good to have some more. All right. Uh, let's see here. Gusto Gustavo, could you talk a bit about Kant's works, reading order? What do you think about his lectures on metaphysics and ethics? Um, you know, Kant's lectures are, are pretty good. They're, they're, they're enjoyable to read. Um, I mean, there's three critiques, right? And so you can lay out the philosophy essentially along those lines if you want to. First critique, theoretical philosophy, essentially epistemology and metaphysics, some stuff about human nature, right? Um, along with that goes the prolegomena to any future metaphysics. Then you have second critique um, and, you know, uh, that's about morality, ethics. <clears throat> Along with that goes the actual ground, the, the metaphysics of morals and the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. Um, that's the stuff that I really enjoy the most. And then you've got, you know, the third critique, critique of judgment and all sorts of stuff connected with that. That's where it gets into the really weird, wacky, wild stuff. And then there's, you know, there's all sorts of occasioned uh, pieces like, you know, what is, what is uh, enlightenment? 
Um, and then there's the anthropology from a pragmatic uh, point of view. Now, do you have to read them in a particular order? I mean, I think maybe Kant thought that you <clears throat> you should, but I think you know once you understand Kant's language, you can read around in his stuff. You don't have to read it. You don't have to like read the first critique before you do anything else. I, I don't think that's absolutely necessary. Um, all right, uh, Anthony Fickery, was Blaise Pascal right to reject natural theology as traditionally conceived? Do you think natural theology can still be valuable despite his criticisms? Yeah, it's better to say that he criticized it than rejected it. He thinks that it could be useful for some people, but it's not as useful as it pretends to be. And, um, you know, he does have some, some good points to make about how it doesn't actually move people. And maybe the God that, you know, Aquinas' five ways lead you to, if you use them in isolation, apart from the rest of the Summa Theologia, which is where they should be embedded, um, doesn't really give you, you know, not even just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but doesn't give you an interesting God at all. Um, a God that you could want to have some sort of connection with. You know, I think that's a valuable criticism. Um, his wager seems kind of a non-starter, <clears throat> in part because of the diversity of religious perspectives, but it's an interesting thing to think about if you understand it in a more pragmatic way. Um, you are, as he said, embarked, and you do have to decide one way or the other. Um, so, yeah, he's, 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 he's definitely worth checking out. Um Bonnie, here in Boston, it's everyone goes online and stays online. Yeah, on the East Coast. So now we're talking about the COVID virus and the university's responses to it. East Coast, West Coast, they responded much quicker. And they're like, we're not bullshitting around. Everyone's going online. We're not going to try to come back after four weeks or anything like that. The way I mentioned some of our local schools are doing, which to me sounds like a, a recipe for disaster. Um I think it's probably smarter just to stay online for the whole semester, you know. All right. Um, John Mann, have you heard of generative anthropology and or Girard? Yeah, back in grad school, I started reading Girard. It asserts that human culture stems mimetic desire and the deferral of violence into the other sort of Schmidian or Hobbesian. Well, it's in a, hopefully getting past that as well. Um, mimetic desire is where you desire because you see somebody else desiring and, and you think, well, I should desire that fish feeding frenzies are, are a popular example of mimetic desire, but you know, uh, the entire culture industry is really based on mimetic desire as well. Um, yeah, but yeah, I've read, I've read Gerard. He's an interesting guy. Just, he's not somebody I do a lot of stuff on, uh, gin stampede. Uh, I apologize for not asking a straight up philosophical question. But, well, you don't have to ask. If, I mean, these are ask me anything, right? Sometimes people ask me about, you know, my, my musical tastes or you saw one about me in the Army. Uh, do you think this pandemic will finally turn the tide regarding U.S. healthcare system and allow universal access? So interestingly, they did some polling recently. And the even when you frame the question in a way that talks about, you know, the government providing universal health care, um, which is often a, a, a way in which people, you know, view it negatively. They asked a question recently, does the current COVID-19 crisis make you, you know, more favorable towards universal health care? Um, and independents and, you know, centrists, they're like, hell yeah. You know, it, it changed, it, it has moved the needle. Republicans and conservatives, not a bit. They're still firmly convinced that we're doing great the way things are currently. And I mean, it just shows you that how, how hardened the attitudes are. So I, I think it's going to lead to, it's definitely going to lead to a discussion. I hope that it leads us eventually to, to saying, this has been ridiculous what we've been doing for the last 30 years. You know, we should have enacted universal health care back during the Clinton administration when they were attempting to do it. The Republicans should not have screwed around with it on the behalf of the insurance agencies. We set a bad tone. We screwed things up. We need to like have a come to Jesus moment and, and say like, wow, look at the rest of the developed world. They're doing it um, when they're doing it right. 
you know, in places like Taiwan and, and you know, um, <clears throat> South Korea, they have responses that are dealing with this stuff. You know, we, we need to quit uh, sacrificing health to the profit motive. We need to start looking at this in a different way. I think there will be a conversation. Whether or not we will move towards it depends entirely on how strong the conservative slash Republican, um, you know, Trump is completely right about everything block remains. And I think when, when, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, I mean, it's not as if the Democrats have clean hands when it comes to a lot of this stuff, but the Republicans um, have, have hurt the, their own constituents so much with their, their policies uh, over the years, uh, particularly with, with what they've done here that I think you're going to see in a lot of red States, a lot of voters finally saying, holy crap, these people do not care about us at all, except for our votes. They've been whipping us up with, you know, xenophobia and the abortion question and this and that, um, and, you know, worries about socialism, but they don't care about us at all. They'd sacrifice us. Uh, the only thing that they, they want is votes from us. I think you're going to see some of that peeling off from the Republican coalition as people get sick and as they don't get treated and as they see the president lying on national television about how great of a response we're providing and how wonderful everything is here. <clears throat> but that's my, that's, that's, that's what I'm, I'm thinking is going to happen. Could be totally wrong. It could actually work the other way. And people are like, yeah, now I believe him even more because, you know, there's nothing there's, you know, at this point, the people who would be repulsed by his moral degeneracy and his constant lying and the corruption of his administration and the incompetence that he brings, um, where he can't even give a proper speech, you know, without lapsing into this almost like baby talk language. If they're, if they aren't turned off by that yet, I, I don't, I don't see them getting turned off by much, much else. So, all right, Nubified Spartan. I teach at Carthage College. I almost went there. I chose Marquette instead, but Carthage was a close second. Yeah, I teach at I teach at Marquette occasionally, and I teach at Carthage. They brought me in to um, they brought me in to uh, teach business ethics, and and they're trying to get me to teach some other things as well. Um. Let's see here. John Mann, I know you like German idealism. Why do you think there seems to be a link between the monism of the West? Uh, Pythagoras, Plato, Leibniz, Schopenhauer with Hindu thought, Advaita Vedanta. I don't think there's a link other than to Schopenhauer. There is zero connection between Pythagoras and Plato and Hindu thought. Um, and Leibniz is not influenced by that either. And Leibniz is not a, is not a monist. Leibniz is a pluralist. If you get the idea that Leibniz is a monist from reading Leibniz, uh, you want to go back and, and reread him, I think, um, because he's, he's got a universe that's that's full of beings, right? All right. Um, John Mann, love you. You're looking good from Ireland. Oh, good. I'm glad the transmission is going through. Uh Egan, is that? Um, it, is it possible to both embrace Kant's ethics and Sartre's existentialism at the same time and apply to your life? No, it's not. Um, there are there are some things where there's overlaps, um, but there's there's some things where you you cannot bring the two of them together. I mean, Sartre would say that Kant does have a concept of of human nature. Sartre is rejecting uh, that. And, um, you know, he rejects anything. He uses something kind of like the first formulation of the categorical imperative, but it's not the first formulation. And, you know, that would just be another form of ethics that you could, you could adapt. All right. Um, let's see here. Cognosco, do you read any non-epic green poetry or plays? I'm not sure what green poetry or plays are. So, oh, Greek. Okay. Uh, Non-epic Greek poetry or plays. Yeah, I read, uh, you know, some Greek lyric stuff. You know, um, do you, I don't know if you know this, but Solon himself actually wrote epic, or not ep lyric poetry. It's all about justice and injustice. Right? So it's kind of, kind of uh, politically oriented, but yeah, I read that. And, you know, I, I, I read, um, 
you know, Greek uh, tragedy and comedy. I, I do enjoy uh, Aristophanes quite a bit. Um, I'm teaching in the intro to humanities class, Sophocles, Antigone. So, yeah. Um, Peter, can we examine the oracle's answer to Chirophon historically, or is it just part of mythos, or would the priest oracle have actually known who Socrates was? I mean, I wouldn't say we need to do any of that with it. Um, you know, it's not part of mythos, um, but do we have like a, a separate attestation about the oracle at, at Delphi saying this and that about Socrates other than the literature that we have? It's not like the oracle wrote something down that historians can go back to. Um, it's not, and it's not, not a major issue that I think people really worry that much about. Um, all right, let's, okay. Opposite. I work in retail and the fear is not from the virus. It's from the absence of state power rationality. People do not know whom to look to for guidance. Well, um, that's your experience. I know other people who work in retail who are actually afraid of the virus. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't generalize from just your uh, view on it to, to everybody else, but that is also an issue. There's worries about what if there's riots, <clears throat> you know, is, how is policing going to work? You know, all, all of those sorts of questions. What if somebody passes out and falls down? You know, you've got to bring the first responders in. Um, let's see here. Ni Haravi, any books you would recommend for a period of self-isolation that might happen due to coronavirus? The stuff that you'd read normally. Now you've got more of an opportunity to set aside time to do the reading that you'd like to do. So if it's fiction, you know, read read fiction. If you want to study philosophy, maybe now is a good time to do it. There aren't any particular recommendations. I know, I know people are buying Camus the Plague and, and talking a lot about it, but um, I think many of them are going to be as disappointed by that as they are the people who, when Trump got elected, bought The Origins of Totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, there's lots of things that aren't necessarily directly connected to plague situations that, that would be good to read. So. Um, where are we? Homoverse. When something is in the state of changing and <clears throat> dynamic, can we say it must have a beginning and an end? Um, I suppose in a lot of cases, sure. But you could have something that's ever changing and doesn't have a beginning or an end. There's no logical necessity to it. Gambrick, are you worried that this will spur a general trend towards anti-public behavior, i.e. increased use of technological mediation to replace traditional public gatherings, things like VR chat? I think those will supplement it. I mean, so, you know, prime example, the Stoic Fellowship, right? We, we got an email recently from the Worldwide Stoic Fellowship thing where the one of, one of the big muckety mucks was saying, hey, you know, Stoics follow the facts, according to Ernest Becker in his a new stoicism right um and so you know we should follow the facts on this and one of the facts is we shouldn't be engaging in public gatherings so your face-to-face -face, um stoic fellowship things you should consider replacing them for a while with you know google hangouts or zoom or this or that that's not a problem um i don't think it's going to replace it forever because people also still do value face-to-face uh, -face interactions. We're going to do the virtual stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of people are like, well, if you do the virtual, then people will never come back to the other stuff. Why would that be the case? You know, you can do both. Um, they can supplement each other. So, um, I mean, I think it's, it, it, there is an interesting point of view here, which is that all the people who have been arguing for virtual um things due to accessibility issues or, um, you know, psychological issues on their part and saying, I want to work from home or I want to do meetings from home. They've now been vindicated by the fact that we actually can do that quite easily. Right. So I think there'll be some conversations, uh, about that. And one of the sad things that I saw was there was a student, I saw this on Twitter who she dropped out of her uh, classes at a university because they would not accommodate her, which which is a violation, by the way, of of um, you know 
laws out there about ADA, right? They wouldn't accommodate her and allow her to um, be in the class virtually. So she dropped out. Of, she dropped out of her her college. And three weeks later, her college switches to all online. And she's like, what the F, you know? And people are like, well, just go back. And she's like, I've already missed three weeks. You know, that's not going to happen. Um, it would have been nice if they would have accommodated me when they could have. And now we know they could have if they wanted to. So I think there's going to be some interesting conversations like that going on. But I don't think that we're going to see a complete replacement of traditional public gatherings after this. All right. Uh Nioise Brownlee, do I enjoy chess or any other board games? I used to enjoy chess. I haven't played it for so long that I don't know whether I do or don't enjoy it. Um, when my kids are here, we sometimes play Settlers of Catan, which is a fun board game. And we also have two Rick and Morty board games, uh, well, which are actually card games. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoy other board games, but I don't find the time for it. And I, I probably should spend more time doing that sort of thing. Uh, so that, that would be, um, quite good. I, I used to do a lot of, you know, war gaming in the past when I was younger, but uh, again, haven't had the time. So, all right. Um, let me scroll down a little bit. Our Timmy Sukoff. I noticed that all smart guys have a bookcase in the background. You can't make that correlation, right? There's a lot of there's also a lot of dumb people who have bookcases in the background, and there's plenty of smart guys who don't. Um, I think when somebody has a bookcase in the background, the question you want to ask them is, is this for show, or have you actually read these books? How many of them are you aspiring to read, and how many of you have you actually read? And there's actually this really great um, uh, satire by Lucian of Sam Soda. Um, the ignorant book collector. You should check it out, right? And it's about this guy who hoards books. And at that time, books are scrolls, right? So he's got a whole library of scrolls and he doesn't read any of them. And he thinks like just by owning them, he acquires the knowledge within them, uh, which clearly is not the case. So, all right, uh, Corey Hillman, are there any philosophical texts you're aware of that address sports? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a whole area of philosophy called the philosophy of sport. That's fairly recent, but you could you could certainly check it out. Um, there, you know, closely related would be what we could call philosophy of play, and um, you know, theories of that sort of thing. Um, Johann Huizinga has a work. What is it called? Play. Uh, it, it, I don't remember exactly the title of it, but he, he touches on sports in there and, and there's, you know, there's discussions here and there about, um, sports, but the, the actual philosophy of sports is a kind of recent thing. All right. Um, let's see here. Oh, I just skipped a little bit. Um, Meme team, dream team. I don't think you'll see this before you end the stream, but what are your thoughts on Husserl? I've been getting interested in him lately through Content Heidegger. So I wrote my, my master's thesis on Husserl's passive synthesis lectures, um, which were, you know, kind of cutting edge stuff at the time. Anthony Steinbach, you know, was teaching a class on it and was working on a translation. He's since left uh, uh, Southern Illinois University um, for going back to Stony Brook. Um, I, you know, I think Husserl is, is worth checking out. I find reading him quite boring, but that doesn't mean that he's not valuable. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot of stuff where he writes and you're like, well, this is really kind of tedious, but some people really get into him and Husserl scholars are like their own little group, you know, doing, doing their own thing. Um, so, you know, if, if I were going to read Husserl, I think I, I would start, I, I, when I started with students, I usually started them with, uh, two things. One was the Cartesian meditations. And then he actually wrote, um, he wrote an article and I think it was for Encyclopedia Britannica about phenomenology where he's explaining what he thinks phenomenology is. So that, that that's quite, you know, useful to take a look at. Um, you know, it's a much later work, but the crisis, 
uh, stuff is 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 uh, that's more interesting in part because he's like thinking about the nature of Europe and 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 you know what's going on as Europe is falling apart around him. Um, obviously, there's all the you know logical investigations, ideas. Those those are worth checking out, but they're they're also kind of tedious too, as you're going to discover. You know, Heidegger is is way more interesting to read. Um, Kant is even more interesting for me to read than Husserl, but you know. All right, Bart Tarr. Of course, the GOP does not care about their constituents. They they are only for billionaire capital. I mean, maybe that's sort of a Marxist take on it. I'd say a lot of them want to make themselves rich through uh, in, indulging their lobbyists. And there's plenty of Democrats who do that too. You know, there's plenty of them in the pocket of the insurance agents, uh, insurance companies. And we have, we, we have a big problem with corruption and not, not just corruption in the sense of taking bribes, but like endemic corruption through our political system. Um, we shouldn't, I mean, really, we shouldn't allow, companies to provide all these perks and, and, you know, benefits to politicians. It's a bad idea. Um, or if we do, we should make the companies like shell out an equal amount for some public good, you know, rather than uh, allowing them to corrupt the, the, the legislative process. Um, but I, I think there's probably a lot of Republicans who are in deep cognitive dissonance right now. They want to think that they're still like good people and, you know, fighting the good fight and all that, but it's becoming more, you know, the, there's more and more things that you have to kind of group think your way to. It's funny because they're the ones who like always want to bring up 1984, but they're the ones who are closer to becoming a party of like, just follow the leader group think, you know, um, than, than the rather fragmented and still, you know, rather free in their speech Democrats. Um, and I say that as an independent who doesn't belong to either party. All right, uh, Evan Nanaj, what are your thoughts on the philosophical thought of nominalism? What's its relationship with postmodernism? How widespread is it? So I would I would caution you against using these isms as substitutes for like actually reading things and checking them out. Nominalism was a movement that we can say essentially began in the Middle Ages. Um, are there, are there a lot of nominalists today? No. Postmodernism, I mean, unless you've actually like read, say, Leotard's Postmodern Condition or Jameson's, you know, Postmodernism, the Cultural Logic of Capitalism, I wouldn't talk about postmodernism because you probably are identifying it with things that it's not. I would not rely on any, any sort of popular takes on postmodernism that say that it's automatically relativism or, or you know, things along those lines because those are all bullshit. Um, there is no intrinsic connection between nominalism and postmodernism. Postmodernism is not a single movement or, or, you know, monolithic way of looking at things. Even nominalism isn't, there are nominal, there are nominalistic philosophers. I mean, you could say that Hobbes is kind of a nominalist, but nobody's truly entirely a nominalist. Everybody's believes in some sort of essences, even the anti-essentialists, uh, when it comes down to it. So, all right. Uh, Panda 85, uh, which view of a virtuous life is best Ayn Rand's or Aristotle's and why Aristotle's, I mean, hands down, um, Ayn Rand is, is at best a third rate philosopher, um, she has a few interesting things to say here and there. Usually when she's saying something that's right, it's because there's other people who are saying it who don't have the commitments that you would have to make to her, her you know, objectivist, rational egoism. Um, she, she, she's a terrible reader of, of other philosophers, gets many of them wrong. She loves Aristotle, by the way, but the Aristotle that she loves is not actually Aristotle, so... You know, um, I mean, if you, it's sort of like saying, uh, we're going to take this, this uh, jalopy, uh, from the 1930s, you know, all cobbled together and we're going to put it against, you know, my, my current vehicle, which is a Subaru Outback. And we'll say, well, which one's better? I mean, you're like, how the hell are you even like asking to compare the two of them? You know, the one is so much better than the other. Um, so Aristotle. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. 
Adam Sharlin, what stoic thoughts do you apply most to your life? So that's a good question. Um, I, you know, I try to make a practice of reading, sort of replenishing my stock of ideas, and the Stoics play a, a role in that, but so do other thinkers. And part of the reason for doing that is to have things, as the Stoics call it, ready at hand, right? To have, you know, a lot of people talk about it as quotes, having quotes ready at hand. Seneca, you know, poo-poos that. Uh, we also call them maxims. But being able to, like, look at things in a Stoic or Aristotelian or uh, existentialist way is very important. That's how you make philosophy practical. And so, you know, the, the dichotomy of control, the distinction between what's in our control, what's not in our control is quite important. Um, the idea for me in dealing with anger management that um, anything that you can accomplish with anger, you can probably accomplish with practical reason and that anger seduces our our practical rationality, which is also something Aristotle knows too, and so do the Platonists. Um, those are all very useful things as well. All right, uh, Evan, is the one of Anaxagoras the same as the monad of Platonism? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I don't think we know enough about Anaxagoras to, to say an awful lot, but it's it seems to be a different kind of thing. Right. Um, skip Hofenflaven. Would I expect a 50 50 split of Platonists and Aristotelians in society overall? No, I would expect a maybe one to one uh, and then 98% being neither. Right. It's not as if the world is split into Aristotelians and Platonists. <clears throat> there are so many other less coherent ways of understanding things and living one's life that are much more common. Um, Fukin Orhan, please make a comment on determinism and its effects on our brain. If the universe is deterministic, which is true, big, big assumption there, then we are also deterministic minds, which means uh, all we do think are memorized patterns, which we should never rely upon. Do you agree? Nope. Because um, I don't actually think that the universe is completely deterministic in the way that the determinists say. I think that we are, to some degree, self-move movers, like Aristotle thinks, and that we emerge from a background of determinism and that there's some spontaneity within it and that we shape it and that the fact that we can become aware of it also allows us to shape it as well. So I don't, I don't, you know, subscribe to kind of a Laplacean, everything is determined from the beginning or a, a you know, Megarian, all propositions are true or false in advance way, which is the way the ancients think about Cicero's on fate talked about it. Um, I think that, you know, there are, you know, I, I think that there are uh, some things that are determined, um, but I don't think that it extends to everything in our, our minds. So, yeah. Um, Casey, have you ever heard of philosophical undergraduate successfully publishing? Do you think it's possible and then recommended to attempt to do so? Yeah, I, there are actually journals that are devoted specifically to undergraduates. Um, there's there's quite a few undergraduate philosophy journals out there, and I would suggest that if you're an undergraduate, um, it's good to submit to those because you're not going to get a lot of prestige out of it. But you know, prestige in philosophy is largely bullshit anyway. You know, there's no consensus. Anytime somebody like is like, these are the top two journals, and these are no good. <clears throat> that's their particular bullshit take, you know, and, and they're not taking the you know, account of the fact that go a couple colleges over and they've got a different take on that sort of thing. Um, there is no universally agreed upon, you know, uh, ranking or anything like that. In part because philosophy itself is so, so pluralized between different, different approaches and schools. So, you know, I wouldn't worry over much about, about prestige or ranking. I would get in there and start, yeah, publishing things. And, you know, the other th bit of advice that I would give, it's, it's, uh, we don't do this enough in philosophy. Um, Co-writing, I think, is a good thing to do. Having to work with another person. It's done much more in the sciences than it's done in the humanities. Uh, it's also done quite a bit in the social sciences. And I've done a bit of it myself, and I like doing it. I, I, I think I kind of missed out by doing so much publishing just on my own. 
and and not not working with other people on it. Um, and now, you know, I a lot of what I what I do is actually uh, projects where I work with other people. And as an undergraduate, you could be doing that with your professor, doing that with other undergraduates, doing it with graduate students that you know, um, maybe doing it with people from other disciplines. That could be a good idea. So. All right. Uh, oh, here's a dumb question from Dan Lee. Do you think that philosophy is just a cope for being too dumb for STEM? I know a lot of dumb STEM people. Um, and there's a lot of people who are very, you know, gifted in one of their fields and they're like idiots when it comes to everything else. Not being able to grasp the larger picture is a failing of a, of a human mind, of an intellect, right? And only being able to see things through the eyes of like, the I fucking love science, you know, people or, you know, STEM lords or stuff like that. That's a real deficit as well. So, I mean, that is, that is really a dumb question. <laughs> is, is philosophy just a coping mechanism for being too dumb for STEM? I don't know. Maybe there's some people who dropped out of STEM to philosophy for that, but you know what happens much more often? You ask too many questions in STEM and they're like, I can't answer these questions. Those are bigger picture. Go over to philosophy. And they do that with economics as well. You know, that's how one of, one of my friends and colleagues wound up doing philosophy. He asked too many questions in economics. Um, and, you know, if you're doing, if you're actually doing STEM stuff at a high level, like, you know, I, I can talk about mathematics, right? Because I, I did a lot of work in mathematics when I was younger. You start going into the foundations of mathematics you're doing philosophy and the people who are only like good at doing computation and stuff like that, they're crap at the higher level stuff. So no, that's, that, that's, that's definitely not the case. Uh, Lenny Penny, how to become a better thinker. Well, there's a lot of ways to do that. I would say part of it is, you know, reading widely and taking in many other people's points of view and trying to learn how not to react as you're reading them and be like, oh, this is garbage, you know, or I can't believe this. But see how, how people think about things. Trying on other people's brains, you might say. Um, Hassan Mir, are you a fan of the, where is it? I just lost the question. Are you a fan of the Pittsburgh school, right? Uh, here we go. Pittsburgh School of Philosophy, McDowell, Brandom, et cetera. Could you explain the main thesis of conceptual realism? Not a fan, so not really. Um, I, I don't I don't pay close attention to them other than reading Brandom from time to time. So uh, let's see here. What do I think of Roger Scruton? Not much. Um, not particularly interested in him. The little bits that I've read have not particularly impressed me. Uh all right, I'm going to oh, – here's a question from Ken. Sarah, I have a bank of questions I save up to ask in AMAs. Do you recommend I limit myself to only say three per AMA or ask them under relevant videos or something else? Um, well, if you have something that's actually relevant to a video, then that's, that's a good place to ask it. Um, and, yeah, I, I actually skip over people who've asked a number of questions – in uh, AMAs and then sometimes come back to them if I, if I can so I can get a wider um, range of, of, of people addressed. Um, Carol Mihai, what's the best argument against the death penalty? Well, that's an interesting one. In the United States, I would say um, the fact that it is ineffective because um, it takes – sometimes up to 20 years to actually execute somebody through all of the uh, appeals and stuff like that. You're not really serving justice at, in any relevant way. And quite often the person who's committed the crime has changed quite a bit by the time that you, you execute them. We also do have some people being executed who didn't deserve to be executed either because they didn't actually do the crime or because, um, you know, they were, like coerced into it or, you know, they had a bad public defender and the prosecutor uh, sometimes manufactured evidence. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of problems with the death penalty. You could say administratively, right? And I think that those are relevant. You know, there, there, there's, there's other things about principle, but I think we really do need to focus on the nuts and bolts on how it actually works, you know? And here's an interesting question I'll, I'll pose you as a conundrum. Let's say that you're not against the death penalty per se. 
when I started working at Indiana State Prison, one of the things that happened in the first week of my working there on X row, which is death row, was three of the inmates conspired along with a corrections officer to um, essentially assassinate one of the other inmates on death row. They somehow got, got out of their cells, got into his cell, uh, got a towel over the camera. There obviously had to be some collusion with, with, with uh, corrections officers. And they came in and they, they shanked him and, and killed him very quickly. Um, now, he was there because he was going to be executed eventually. And he was so, I guess, so hated by the other death row prisoners that they decided to, to kill him. Um, was it a bad thing that they did that? I mean, formally, we could say, or just considering the nature of the action, yes, it's a bad thing to kill somebody. Um, and you could say, well, the state didn't kill him. It was these other prisoners acting essentially as vigilantes. Um, but he was going to be executed anyway for, you know, and I don't, I don't remember the exact thing, but in Indiana, generally you had to have done stuff pretty bad to, to earn the death penalty. <clears throat> they had a moratorium on it for a while. So, you know, it's a good, good, good one to think about. Abdullah, how can one be be a Stoic and not become completely insensitive? Do Stoicism right. I mean, start by reading the texts. Read uh, Epictetus, read Seneca, read Marcus Aurelius, and that will cure you of this idea that being a Stoic means being completely insensitive. Epictetus actually has an entire thing on what indifference towards externals consists in. There's like a whole chapter on it. Um, so don't buy into popular wrong-headed conceptions of stoicism. That'd be the first thing. Read the stoic literature, connect up with other people who are, who are practicing stoicism, see that they are not insensitive. That'll probably take care of it for you. Um, let's see here. Uh, boo, 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 doo, doo. What else do we have? Um, Nishant, are you into Nick Land and the CCRU folks? I am not. Um, people often want to get me to talk about Land. I haven't read Land. Um, I, I've said many times, somebody wants me to read Fang Numina, send me a copy, right? And not a PDF, but an actual physical copy. Uh, Andrew Wu, what's your opinion on the debate between Zizek and Peterson? A, a non-event, you know, uh, didn't need to happen, didn't contribute anything. Um, Peterson showed up totally unprepared. Uh, I'm not really interested in what either of them have to say. So for me, I, I didn't care. You know, it was just sort of a publicity thing. Jay Papineau, do you think that America is becoming a gerontocracy? If, if so, does this have a negative, does this have negative consequences? Yeah, I do. So what is a gerontocracy rule by the older? And I would say that the rule in this case is not just political rule, but dominance within um, society in terms of the economy and jobs and work, in terms of education, in terms of prestige. Yes, I think America has become a gerontocracy and it is the boomers who are effectively running things, unfortunately. And I think that there are many good boomers. You know, I count my dad as one of them. Um, but um, many of them have become, as human beings do, quite selfish and should have stepped out of the way uh, so that, you know, those of us who are younger could have moved into leadership a long time ago. And many of them didn't because, you know, the stock market crash and their portfolio, but many of them didn't because they like to be in charge. And uh, I think there is a huge generational gap with them not realizing that, you know, they have had it particularly good. There are exceptions, of course, but as a generation, they have. And standard of living has declined uh, for my generation, for, for the millennials, for Generation Z. And the situation that we're in has changed as well. We are an environmental uh, uh, catastrophe in many respects, you know not just about uh, uh, climate change, but think about the degradation of, of the oceans and uh, all the, the pollution that's taken place and the killing off of species. We are in, we are in some serious uh, times that are going to require some, some 
new adaptive uh, solutions. Um, we have massive inequality. A lot of that inequality is lying along generational lines. Um, the younger generations, uh, you know, if you think about in terms of racial dynamics and white supremacy, which is an actual thing that that, that does still exist in many places, a big problem here in, in the Milwaukee area in terms of policing, for example, um, but also in terms of jobs. Um, that also splits along generational lines as well. Um, and we know that, you know, the, the older people are the ones who are most likely to share fake news in part because they haven't figured out how to adapt themselves to the internet age. So we, yeah, there are a lot of negative effects to a gerontocracy. That's not to say that a gerontocracy is necessarily bad, but this gerontocracy is. So that, that is a, a real problem. Um, Johan Sig, can Aristotle be interpreted properly while eschewing his unmoved mover in a thoroughly secular way? Unmoved mover is already a secular way. That's not the God of Isaac, Abraham, and, and, and Jacob. Uh, you can make whatever you want of the unmoved mover. Um, I think your, your notion of secular there is probably a little narrow. Um, Bradley McManus. So here's an interesting question. What are your thoughts on punk rock and anarchy? I think a lot of the punk people didn't really believe in the anarchy stuff that they were saying. And, um, but you know, it was, it was cool to talk about at the time. Um, the, the punk movement was not something I myself got into. And as a matter of fact, as I was growing up for a while, there was a real animosity between punk rockers and heavy metal, uh, people, metal heads. And I know this was never an issue for me, but for like the people who were older than me, they used to get in fist fights, you know, and, and, and all sorts of crazy stuff with each other. Um, by the time that I was really paying close attention to music in the eighties, punk had kind of worn itself out. We we're in the post-punk era with, with bands like the violent femmes and new model army. And, and, you know, uh, it was no longer quite as cool to be unproficient on an instrument. I mean, you listen to the basis of new model army and violent femmes and they're pretty amazing, uh, technicians, right? Um, but then, you know, punk kind of comes back and there's still like this, this ethos out there. Um, but I don't think it necessarily connects up with anarchy or anarchism in any, any real relevant way, except with particular groups. Right. Um, J.M. Alcom, you said the world is not split into Platonists and Aristotelians. However, do you think Kant and Hegel are split into similar lines? No, not at all. Um, I, I would actually, you know, here's here's my bit of advice. I would get rid of that idea of of trying to schematically shoehorn people into like easy, you know, this side, this side sort of stuff. Um, Kant and Hegel are doing very different things. They're both drawing upon stuff, but they're also, you know, they're also influenced by Descartes, who's neither a, a Platonist or an Aristotelian, you know. Um, and there's all sorts of things. That's what's cool about philosophy. It doesn't just start out with, you know, a couple basic options and then we just repeat them ad nauseum. Then, then it would really be boring, you know. Um, all right, let's see. I'm going to keep going probably uh, since I'm, I'm, you know, Today, you know, not going anywhere. Uh, we're already like past the hour and a half mark. I'll keep going to about two hours or so. Um, thanks for all your work. Divinity School student taking secular philosophy classes here. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm glad that, that helps, helps you. Factotum, Italy has great problems with prison riots. Is the U.S. government at all concerned about that? Corona will hit the substantial U.S. prison population. Are there any measures taken at all? And is it ethical to keep people in conditions that are basically the same as an incubator for illnesses? So, good questions there. Uh, first thing that you got you to gotta understand, and a lot of people don't really get this, not only non-Americans, but a lot of Americans, there is no prison system any more than there is an educational system or a policing system here in the United States. We have um, 50 different states. Each one of them has a Department of Corrections or a Bureau of Corrections, right? They run the prisons in that state. What happens in Illinois is totally independent of what happens in Indiana, what happens in Wisconsin. 
right? None of them are connected. And even within the same prison system, there can be a lot of autonomy of local prisons. Then we have the counties. Every single county has a jail system. And we have, you know, thousands of counties across the United States. Some of those county jail systems, for example, the L.A. County jail system or the Cook County jail system in Chicago are larger than some of the state department, departments of corrections. So they are their own separate animals. Um, every one of them is independent of the other one. Then we have the federal system. People who have been convicted of federal crimes go to federal prison. That's a different thing. Then we have the Department of Justice, which has very little oversight of what happens at the state or local level. So you see we have all these different things going on, right? Um, there is no system. What happens in, in you know, the L.A. County jails is totally separate from what happens in the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. And, you know, they, there's, there's networks, there's connections, but... There isn't one single thing from on high. So, uh, you know, is the U.S. government concerned about it? I doubt it because it's usually seen as something, unless it's federal prisons, it's seen as a local issue. Are state governments concerned with it? I haven't heard anything. And I'm actually like, you know, teaching prisoners in the Wisconsin DOC. Um, there are some arguments being made, mostly by people on the left, um, saying that we should we should take some of the at risk prisoners out of the prisons and put them somewhere else. That it's it's inhumane to keep you know the aged or the immunocompromised in in prison right now. That it's effectively giving them a death sentence. And yes, prisons are the you know like whenever there's there's a a, a major epidemic, prisons are one of the places where it can it can just spread very quickly. Healthcare, you know, a lot of people have, have negative attitudes about prisoners. They're like, oh, they, they get three square meals a day and exercise and get to watch TV and good med free medical care. That's all bullshit. The three square meals a day are inadequate food, often 50 cents a day worth of food. You know, you try to live on that, right? The healthcare, which often prisoners have to pay a copay for, you know, and it, it might be a $15 copay, which sounds good to you, but when you're earning 20 cents an hour at your job, not so good, right? That's your, your whole month's uh, work right there. Um, and the people, you know, who are providing medical care in prisons, they're not doing a great job. Um, so yeah, we, we have a situation that is really primed for epidemic to spread in prisons. I mean, this is why like even before the crisis, way back when I was teaching in Indiana State Prison, I had to get tested for tuberculosis every year because TB spreads in the prisons. Uh, hepatitis does, you know, there's all sorts of stuff. So are there any measures being taken? I haven't heard of a single thing. Will this lead to riots? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, if there are, it'll probably be sort of a law and order mentality, unfortunately, that uh, gets applied to them. All right. Uh, Shlomo, is there a place in academia for studying mystical theology from a philosophical perspective, or am I just wasting my time trying that? There probably is. There probably are places, but you're going to have to work to find them. Um, so it's going to be probably in the philosophy of religion uh, or philosophical theology. And, you know, not every place is going to be interested in that or accommodating that. Uh, Weston D. Hagman, how has Epictetus influenced Karl Marx and St. Benedict? I don't think he influenced Karl, Karl Marx at all. You may be thinking of Epicurus. Um, Marx wrote his, his dissertation on Epicurus, but he didn't have anything to say about Epictetus. Did Epictetus influence St. Benedict at all? Probably not, although he could have in this sense. The Enchiridion uh, survives into monastic literature in a Christianized version in which um, the philosopher is called the monk and Socrates is uh, changed to Christ. And there's a few interpolations in the text where they add something. Could Benedict have read that? He could have, but I don't know. I don't know that Epictetus himself was read by Benedict. So, all right. Um, 
Niharavi, favorite album from the 60s. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, man. I don't know. I mean, I'll tell you who I really like from the 60s. Uh, of course, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Cream, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Um, who else do I... I mean, I, I like the Rolling Stones and some of their, their stuff. Um, but I don't have favorite albums because I wasn't really collecting albums from the '60s. You know, I was I was collecting stuff from the '70s and '80s, and and you could say the '90s until like you know we started moving everything to MP3. Um, Abdul, whose fiction do you prefer, Camus or Sartre? Well, I think Camus is a better writer than Sartre. <laughs> Quite frankly, um, I I like Camus. Uh, his I like his fiction better than Sartre's. Yeah, um, John Ortiz. Do you read more physical books or eBooks, PDFs? Do you notice a difference? I will always read a physical book in, in preference to a PDF, but I'll read PDFs if need be. It they're functional for me. Is there a difference? Yeah, you read things differently. You can't underline the same way. You can you know highlight stuff in a PDF, but you can't underline in your book. I like to have physical books in my hands and you notice a lot behind me. Um, but it is nice to be able to carry around a lot of stuff on my laptop and, and Kindle and stuff like that. Um, all right. Let's see here. Do, do, do. Let's see if I can find some that I haven't, some people I haven't answered before. Joe Morrison, uh, what are my thoughts on the phenomenology of Merleau-Ponty with relation to the embodied nature of intentionality? Yeah, I like Merleau-Ponty. Um, the Phenomenology of Perception is a really good book in phenomenology. And I, I kind of like it in part because Merleau-Ponty's take is that there's all these different systems that, that we've got and they come together in normal perception and it's only when things like break down that we can we can see them as working separately from each other. And you know, embodiment, we are definitely embodied. Um, the body may not be all that we are. Um, I hope that it isn't. Um, but we are we are certainly embodied beings, and intentionality does work that way. I mean, you you can you know you can like sense another body looking at you, right? Now that may seem more Sartre, but Merrill Ponty talks about that as well as well. So, um, all right, what, what can I, Oh, we only got a couple minutes left before I got to like start doing some other work for the day. Uh, let me see if I can grab, uh, something else that I can answer quickly. Um, mm, here's a good one from, from, uh, Ari Wells. Did you ever have doubts about pursuing a career in philosophy? How did you overcome those doubts? Did you ever get depressed from reading a certain philosophical work? So I never really got depressed from reading a philosophical work. I sometimes experience what Aristotle calls emulation, or in Greek, zelos, uh, which is a sort of pain in seeing the accomplishment of another and wishing that you had been able to do it. And Aristotle actually, interestingly, he says that it's, it's different than envy. Envy is actually a sign of bad character. Zealous is a sign of good character because you recognize the goodness of the thing and you're like, oh man, I wish I had done that. So, you know, prime example of, of that, I'll, I'll show you two books that I wish I had written that I've got laying around because I was using them for tutorials, obviously at McIntyre's After Virtue. And Nancy Sherman's The Fabric of Character, wonderful books. Um, and, you know, I would like to be able to write that sort of stuff, you know, down the line. But I, I've got some other stuff around here as well that, that fits that bill. Now, did I, did, I ever, um, did I ever have doubts about pursuing a career in philosophy? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I... At one time, I've told this story before, I actually, um, I was taking, you know, uh, poetry classes. I was sitting in on them with Carl Elder at Lakeland College, and I was majoring in philosophy and mathematics, and I said, you know, I think I really want to be a writer, 
wouldn't it be better for me to major in English and drop the philosophy stuff? And then he was like, no, do not, do not switch to writing, you know, uh, or, or to English. You're going to be a way better writer if you stick with philosophy. I can't, you know, and he also said, I can't stand these precious English majors. Don't become one of them, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, there were other times, like when I was actually engaged in the field and teaching full-time as an assistant professor, um, who, you know, when, when I... Um, I thought, yeah, am I kind of spinning my heels here, wasting my time? A lot of people don't understand this, but the job market in philosophy is very arbitrary, and it's been so for a very long time. It's not based on talent. It's largely based on your connections and where you went to school. And if you're first-generation college, let alone graduate you know, school, you don't know how the game works. And that can be very dismaying. You know? You're like, oh, how come I'm not getting any traction or things like that? So, you know, that, that wound up being, um, a concern sometimes, but I always, um, I always found it useful to, to keep, um, plugging away at it. Cause I, I, you know, I love the discipline and I, <clears throat> I wanted to study the, the people that I was studying. I saw a value there. And once I started seeing how a lot of this could be applied in practice outside of, uh, you know, traditional academia and doing executive coaching and uh, doing consulting for, you know, companies, you know, mostly on ethics issues and things like that. Um, I, I uh, and also working with individuals doing, doing philosophical counseling and coaching. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed working in the field. It can be frustrating at times. Um, and I think for, for those who are considering entering into the field right now, the job market, which was bad when I came out of graduate school, it was pretty terrible, like 300 applicants to every job on average. Um, many of whom would, would be people who are like already, you know, tenured and are trying to like trade up or, or something like that, or, you know, use it as leverage to get a, a raise. Um, the job market now is even worse. So I don't know that I would advise people to try to go into this, this same field. I'm fortunate that I can teach as an adjunct. I can choose to teach as an adjunct. I don't have to. Um, I'm, I actually, you know, I do split my time between my business work, applying philosophy, and then teaching. Um, so I can sort of give back by, by the teaching that I do. And I get more teaching requests than I can, I, I can fill. Um, but I've been doing this for 20 years going into it right now, it's kind of a dismal prospect. I feel bad for the graduate students that I see right now scrambling, getting their stuff ready. And now we've got, you know, the whole hiring thing has been put on hold because of coronavirus. So, yeah. All right. We are coming up on the, the two hour mark. Um, and let's see if there's anything else. Um, that's good to bring up. Um, Foucault and Orhan has got all sorts of stuff on determinism. Um, you know, you, you can always write me about it. I mean, you heard what I had to say about determinism. Clearly you're riding your hobby horse pretty far, um, on that, but you know, we can always, uh, go into it if you want to schedule a session or something. Uh, what else do we have? That's an interesting, question um oh here's here's a good one uh mr Dharam Paji, can you elucidate the the relationship between anthropology and philosophy who's your favorite anthropologist so there isn't a relationship there's a whole set of relationships because anthropology came out of philosophy and then it, it quickly like assumed just like psychology sociology most of the ologies came out of philosophy right and it assumed its own sort of path, but then it's split into all these different schools, many of whom don't like each other. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's battles in anthropology that are just as bitter as those between continental and, and analytic philosophy or between different analytic philosophy projects and each other, or the, the battles within continental philosophy where, you know, uh, us people doing other, other forms like classical American philosophy or comparative philosophy sit on the sidelines and are like, wow, look at these, look at these jokers, you know? 
So the same thing happened in anthropology. So you can't you can't say that there's a single relation between the two fields. There's a lot of cross fertilization, just as there is with sociology and psychology. Do I have any favorite anthropologists? I don't. Um, but I would say that you know I always like to run into people who have read some some stuff that we have in common and we can use it as a sort of common language. So I've run into anthropologists who shared my interest in communication, for example. Um, so that's a good one <clears throat> to end on. Um, hope all of you are safe and stay well. Um, I haven't gotten sick yet, so things are, you know, uh, we'll see how things, how things develop. Um, and uh, I'm going to be doing the quarantining for, for a bit. I'll probably do some more online events than I originally thought, um, in part because there's going to be so many people home and, and not working that maybe it, it's good to do that. But now I actually got to get on with the rest of the day, which is like getting my own students um, up to, to, to par and putting the, the material completely online and figuring out how I'm going to have them do, do their group projects and all all that sort of stuff. So um, I'll see all of you somewhere else in the ether. We are, we're not doing any face-to-face -face events here in the Milwaukee area, so I can't say that I'll see any of you in person anytime soon, but um, we'll get through this eventually, I hope.